this is uh, EE380 for uh, um, May 10th, uh, 2023. And our speaker is uh, Ken Kant, who is uh, retired in Oxford after being at Oxford and soon will be back at Oxford. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> hope so. um, Ken, Ken was uh, back in the uh, dark ages at uh, Xerox Park for a bit. And there he worked on a project which became a, a lifetime obsession, I guess, called Toon Talk, mm -hmm. which was the first uh, really configurable programmable animation system. And in its day, um, golly, I hate to think of how long ago that was, uh, it was, was, was really the most amazing thing. And rather than go the commercial route and, and, and build video games, it can kept poking away at the methodology and the underlying structures by which you tell stories through pictures and voice. Um, he recently did some work collaborating with uh, uh, Chat GPT-4, and unlike a lot of people who uh, looked at it as using it as a tool, he, he appears to uh, to believe, as I do, that Chat GPT-4 is just another programming companion, a worker, a colleague, and used it in a very interesting way. So I'm going to let you just go on from there. And uh, feel free, by the way, if you're in the audience, to interrupt with questions and so forth. And uh, if it gets to be a, a, a diversionary thing, we'll either accept it or not. <laughs> go on, Ken. Good. Um, let me, uh, uh, there we go. Move this. Uh, <clears throat> the Zoom stuff was sort of in the way. All right. So thanks everybody for for coming and um, feel free to interrupt, ask questions at any time. And this is uh, <clears throat> what I'll be talking about is some uh, experiments I've done trying to create apps, just having conversations with a language model. But first, maybe I'll give you a tiny bit of background. So I was doing good old fashioned AI for about 20 years, first at the MIT AI lab and then Xerox Park and so on. And then I got into the idea of creating a programming language for children that was completely based around animation. There was no text involved. And, uh, and then in the middle of that, I also got involved in Oxford in a big project trying to make it possible for um, people to make agent-based simulations of you know, uh, epidemics or ant colonies or uh, whatever. And then I got involved in 2016 in a big European research project where my role was to make it possible for the students, and these were uh, 11 to 14 year olds, to be able to incorporate machine learning in, in their projects. So I built upon the SNAP programming language, which is more uh, adult version of Scratch, and added lots of uh, blocks for doing computer vision or, or uh, natural language processing, or to be even, even able to just create um, neural networks and train them right there in the browser. And that was my focus until um, ChatGPT came along, and, um, and I've been focused on treating ChatGPT as, as a colleague here. So I'm going to give a, a really detailed story about one conversation I had with ChatGPT, which involved building a fireworks application. And then I'm going to um, touch on some of these other examples that uh, I've also done with uh, ChatGPT. And I keep saying ChatGPT, and um, I started it with uh, the older one, but as soon as I had access to GPT-4. I only used the uh, GPT-4 version of it, which is just so much more capable than any of the other ones. And I've done uh, attempts to see if I could do it with, with Microsoft Bing or Google's Bard or 
Hugging Chad or Claude from Anthropic or Pi, which just came out. And um, all of them did pretty poorly. Though I did just read that today Google's uh, said they're going to be announcing a, a new version of Bard that's um, more capable in, in generating code. So maybe uh, it'd be an equally good alternative. And I didn't really explore very carefully the older version of chat GPT. So the first example I'll give you is where the I asked chat GPT to be more like a tutor and, and I myself pretended to be a student. But then the other six examples, it's much more of pair programming where the chatbot is really doing all of the programming. And I'm kind of uh, the navigator kind of saying, oh, we should try this, so that's not working, or what about this problem? Uh, I also have to, just because of the current technology, do a little bit of copy and paste, but that's very mechanical and not very interesting. So first thing to understand is that these are much more than just uh, code generators, that they, um, let me move this. Um, they could, they, they just by their nature, will will not just give you code, but give you explanations of what's going on in the bigger picture and how that works. And uh, and then if you ask, it'll always put some comments in the code. But if you don't really understand some function, you could just ask it to uh, comment it, and it'll every little section it'll put in comments and not just sort of meaning. I mean redundant comments, but ones that are actually quite helpful. And you could always ask questions, why, you know, what is this primitive doing or how does this function work? Or, and, and you, you tend to get back really useful answers. And the other thing is it's, it often makes, you know, constructs buggy code, but if you tell it about the bugs, especially if you just copy and paste the error messages into the chat, it could fix them. And then if you ask it and you say, okay, could you think of ways to improve this app? It'll come up with a lot of sensible suggestions. Um, and then there's been cases where it couldn't generate some code because it was trained two years ago and there, it was using an API that's uh, much newer than that. And all I did was copy and paste the documentation into the uh, chat GPT and it, you know, read it in seconds and was able to generate code. And it could also generate documentation. And it's also important, especially when you're thinking about uh, children using this, that you could set, you could tell it from the beginning, you know, uh, you're talking to a, a, a young child and it'll use a different kind of uh, vocabulary and avoid more technical things and so on. So I, all of these experiments, I decided to use, uh, ask it to, do, to create a, a web app in JavaScript, you know, with some HTML and CSS. And the reason for that is these three reasons is that there's nothing for anyone would need to install because everybody's got a browser. And browsers are so capable these days, you know, they've got speech synthesis, speech recognition, they, you know, they could easily communicate with all sorts of APIs and so on. And, uh, and then it's so much easier for people to share. You, you could actually just send the index.html file and the script.js file to your friends, or you could host it any number of places for free, just as static web pages. You don't have to run a server or anything. And uh, what professional programmers are using. I, I recently read a survey that said something like about 75% of people that are using large language models to help with their programming are using the Visual Studio Copilot, but 20 or 25% are doing what I'm doing, which is just to have a conversation with a chatbot that could program rather than have it nicely integrated. And of course, being nicely integrated you know, you don't have to do the copy and paste, and it maybe understands more of the bigger context. It's, 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 a, but it's much too complicated to imagine a typical uh, school student using it. Okay, so the example that I want to start with is this uh, fireworks one, which um, 
I, as I said before, this one's a little different than the other ones I'm going to talk about because I, I, I mean, I asked it from the beginning to be uh, more like a tutor than just a, a colleague. Uh, and it, it, as you'll see, there's uh, myself or my the persona I was pretending to be this. Yeah, and I needed to know something about JavaScript, but not that much. Uh, and I'll show you the the result in a minute. But let's. Um, just go through what this conversation was all about. So um, I assume everybody could read this, the font's big enough and all that. The, the, um, I, I started it off by just saying, you're a tutor for beginner programmers first learning JavaScript. You provide hints and explanations, but never provide complete solutions. Instead, you nudge the learner towards solutions. And it says, sure, I'll be happy to help. And then I said, can you, uh, how can I program a display of fireworks? And it says, oh, well, using a canvas is probably the best way to go. And then it actually comes up with this, uh, whatever it is, eight point plan for how to actually build this, including you know, making different classes and having an animate and so on. So uh, this is one of the few places where this very nice tool called sharegpt.com fell down, which is, it, it makes for a really nice way of sharing your, uh, uh, your conversation with, with GPT. It, it, you just push a button and it creates a URL that has the entire thing. But for some reason, this, because I had copy and pasted here, this tiny little index HTML file I had. But what it was, I'll tell you right now, is, is it simply, it said here to create a, create a canvas, um, so it was just basically the rare bones of a, a HTML file with, with a canvas and nothing really uh, else. And, you know, it's the response always in this real nice, encouraging, friendly way that a good tutor maybe should be, you know. Well, that was a good starting point of our recommending a few more things. You could add these more features. And then it generates this. And you could just simply, in the live version of this, I just click on copy code and then it's on the clipboard. And then I just create a folder called fireworks and I create a file called index.html and just paste this into it. You know, so I don't really need to be um, very technically competent to, to have this kind of a experience. So then remember it said also here uh, that I should, um, use this get element by ID and, and get context. So I'm assuming I knew a little bit here. So I said, you know, oh, I, I just started, I did these two lines of code and it's, you know, great start and all that. So then it suggests that I um, size the canvas and have it uh, adjust whenever the browser window is, is um, uh, resized so that you you always have a canvas that's the right size. So I just again you know copy code and just pasted it in. But it said the next thing it said here was to create a, a class for fireworks. So I pretended not to know how to do that. So I said how do I define a class? And it gives a nice explanation and gives a nice little a generic uh, example of a of a class and uh, how you can make an instance. And then I actually made this mistake. I, I, I meant to say, how's this and paste in my uh, little bit of code, but it, it noticed that I forgot to include the, the code that it wanted me to review. So here, so then I just pasted it in. So this is, you know, my attempt to be a beginning student who, who kind of figured out from what it was saying that this is what, what I should do. And, uh, Again, you know, it's encouraging. It's on the right track, but here's a few suggestions. You know, the convention is this should be kept, start with a capital letter. The, you know, I should have a update method and maybe adding gravity would be good. So, so it suggests this update and then, then I should define these two methods. Um, and then I was thinking, um, that I, uh, you know, if I, uh, uh, I'm assuming that a student at least understands a little bit about velocity and gravity. If not, they, I'm sure they could have asked 
chat GPT here, but but I didn't know whether it would matter if I update the vertical position and then update the velocity or update the velocity and then the vertical position. And um, it says differentially minimal, but most people do it this way and it's a little bit better to do it in this order. And then it gives me uh, the, the code for it. So at that point, I pretend not to know how to, how to, how to actually draw the um, fireworks rocket. And, uh, you know, it says, oh, well, you know, we could do it. The simplest thing would be to make it be a circle. And here's the code. And notice it generated all these comments in it and so on. And then it gives a nice explanation of how this works and what it's doing. So now I have the bare minimum of, of this program, but I, I, I guess I'm pretending that I have no idea how to even test this. So it says, oh, well, you could create a sample fireworks with these uh, parameters and then create an animation loop that just continually calls update and draw. And um, again, it explains what's going on and how to get this to work. And, and then it says, you know, just, you know, this code should be in the file called fireworks.js and then just click on the index.html file in the browser and you'll see it working. And then I, it wasn't working. So, um, so I was smart enough to say, well, how could I see if there's an error message? And then it tells me about different ways I could get to the console and see what an error message is. And then I copy and pasted the error message in here. And it realized that <coughs> the problem was that the JavaScript was running before the page had fully loaded. And it gives two, two ways of solving this. You use the Windows on load, or you could simply move the script uh, later in the um, HTML. And I did the latter. So at that point, I, I, I saw the, a rocket go up, um, but I, it, I, it wasn't exploding yet, of course. So I, I didn't have a good idea how to do the explosion. And it, it comes up with this plan for how to do it and a basic outline of how to uh, implement it. Um, you know, where the, it makes 50 particles and they all go off in random directions and with some random speeds. And um, so then uh, I thought, well, it wasn't clear if I should just, because the, the fireworks rocket and the particles were, had very similar ways of being drawn and being um, updated, whether I should really just copy the same code. And then it says, oh, well, you know, you could create a base class and then have a called moving object and then fireworks and particles could be um, uh, subclasses that extend it. And it, again, it's just giving you the sketch of how to do it. It doesn't fill in everything for you or, right now. So, um, uh, so I kind of followed this advice, but I didn't understand again, uh, how I could test it. Because remember the test before was just whether you could get a rocket to go up, but how do I test the explosion? And it <clears throat> comes up with, again, a, a nice little plan for, for doing it. Of how to, uh, <clears throat> and then it gives the sort of sketch of the, of the code. Um, and leave some things for me to do and so on. But, uh, and again, it explains what to do. Um, so, um, so it was giving me explanations and I said, how, how, about, how, how about this uh, for, for creating a, a test fireworks? And uh, it said, it looks good. And, um, and it'll create one, you know, explains what it'll do. It'll be at the bottom and somewhere uh, but it'd be red and initial velocity and the gravity or something. And then it's trying to be kind of, again, I think it's pretty good that it doesn't just um, make me feel like I'm, you know, ignorant and it's so knowledgeable. It says, well, here's a small suggestion, you know, it'd be nice to make uh, the colors uh, random rather than just oh, all, the, all of them being red and provides a, a very simple little function for coming up with a 
uh, random color and then shows how I could use it. So I tried all that. And now remember, uh, it doesn't have any idea what uh, what's going on. I have to always tell it how things are going. And I s said, uh, I think the fireworks would only go about a third of the way up of the screen and blow up and they weren't using the full canvas. And it gives a nice explanation that that depending on the initial velocity and the gra gravity value, they may not be in balance. So it suggests that I uh, increase the velocity and decrease gravity. And I tried it and now they flew off the top of the canvas, but because it kind of explained what was going on, I just uh, only increased the velocity and left gravity alone and it was working just fine. So, and it, you know, and it approved my uh, changes to its suggestions. And, um, you know, it, it's saying there's no correct value. You could play with different ones. You could explore, to, you know, until you get something you're happy with or something. So then I ask, well, how can I add sound effects to this? And it explains that there's the audio API built into the browser and it can read file, I mean, play files with these extensions and it creates a tiny little function for doing it. And it suggests that, you know, you put play sound of the launch when the fireworks are created and then you um, play the explosion when, um, when, the, when it explodes. And then I ask it, can you help, how would you suggest I search for the two sounds that we need? And it says, certainly there's a lot of websites with free or paid ones. And it says, this one is a collaborative one with Creative Commons licensed sound. And then it even suggests, maybe it was up here. Yeah, the, the keywords, I searched for fireworks launch or rocket launch or fireworks explosion. So I, I put them in just as it suggested. And then I thought it'd be nice to have a button that when you push starts everything up rather than it just uh, happens. So, um, so it says, well, you could just add uh, this um, button to your uh, HTML, and then, um, and then in your JavaScript, get hold of that button and put a listener that. And it, it had this idea that <clears throat> you don't start the fireworks until some global variable is set. And I could have just copied that, but I said, you know. I understood that if all I want to do is when the button is pushed, that it starts animating, why not just start animating? So I said, can't I just do that? And it says, oh, yeah, you're right. That's more direct and, you know, straightforward. And, you know, said, don't, don't add this start fireworks flag, but instead, you know, uh, use this kind of code or change the code, you know, with this uh, aspect. Um, and then uh, I noticed that the, the request animation frame used to be at the, the first thing it did. And that was the last thing. And I just got curious and said, does it matter whether it's at the beginning or the end? And it, it says it can have an impact, but the difference is usually subtle and explains how there's a risk that if you, if, if you do it in the beginning, you might be, um, uh, you might lead to some performance issues and so on. So everything was working. And then I, I, uh, in one of some of those suggested code, there was a comment saying that uh, you should, I should implement something that would remove the particles. Um, and um, I just said, you know, you, you said I should remove the particles, but I didn't do it and everything's working fine anyways. And it explains that, you know, basically if, you, if you're, <clears throat> I might end up consuming a lot more memory and processing on particles that are no longer visible or relevant. And that could lead to making everything go slow or use a lot of memory. And it suggests um, a lifespan, but I said, I'd rather have it just removed when they're no longer visible. And it said, sure, that's reasonable and generated the, condition here for when it, uh, particles off the outside, uh, not visible anymore. And 
so everything was working, but there was an annoying little scroll bars and horizontally and vertical. And um, so I said, I see these scroll bars and it, it said, well, maybe it's because the canvas and the page aren't the right size and it suggested all this, but actually that that's very close to what it had before. And I said, it didn't help. And then it came up with um, uh, some more CSS to kind of deal with it. And I said, yeah, a little bit better, but because the scroll bars were you know, less of an issue, but they still were there. I mean, there was very little scrolling involved. So then it said, well, maybe we just have to remove a few pixels from the window dimensions of, uh, of the canvas. And it suggested removing, you know, uh, four pixels. And I tried it and it didn't work, but when I, to 10, it was fine. So everything was fine. And then I said, well, you know, fireworks should happen at night. It should be a black background. So it just generated, you know, these two lines of code here rather than clearing it. And then I said, I can't think of any other improvements. Can you? And it came up with, what is this? Nine different improvements. You know, a couple of them actually were already done. I didn't seem to remember that it already randomized the colors and had a variable radius, but uh, but it could have, you know, we could add wind or air resistance, we could have more different shapes, we could have a trail, you know, more user activity, you know. Um, so I thought, well, I'll just pick one of them, this number five. So it suggested adding, you know, an alpha value and, uh, and then the update uh, uh, uses it. Um, but notice that um, there's this thing called global alpha, and I would have thought somehow alpha itself was all. So I just, I never heard of global alpha. What is it? And it gives me a nice explanation and how it works and why he's using it and so on. So then um, uh, w when I tried doing the change that it suggested, uh, I got this error message that, that you must call the super constructor in a derived class since I was altering the subclass without calling the super. And it said, oh, you just have to add this line. Um, and um, so that fixed that problem. And then I said, um, you know, it'd be nice if the app actually had a little note saying this was created with the help of GPT-4 uh, and having a link to the log. And it created all this nice CSS and it created this uh, div with the description and the link and so on. And then uh, it generated all this code, but it actually forgot to, to add the, um, uh, include the JavaScript script, the, the script element had been there and it just forgot it when it was putting this in. So I just said, You've... but again, this is just, this wasn't a problem originally. This is a problem with the, the shared GPT that sometimes when I paste things, uh, they don't somehow make it into this history, I don't know. Um, so then I said um, that, you know, you forgot this, but I added it. And then we want to remove the button after it's clicked and everything's, Working, but this is a problem that happens on many of the occasions, which is uh, it, it used the word init here, while earlier it was using the 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 name of the function was animate, and I told it, you know, I, I fixed it, but you you know, but I think because these conversations get long and the context is limited to, I don't know. I think it's up to eight thousand tokens for ChatGPT four, and there's a thirty two K version that uh, don't have access to, but um, but so so as a result, it's kind of forgetting some of the earlier stuff that it told me, and it was just guessing. And this is a common problem. I'll show you where where it forgets exactly what a variable name or a function name is, and, and then it generates code with a similar name with the same kind of concept, but but obviously one that won't work because computer programming languages need the exact same name. So let me show you the result of all of this. So if I click here. That's pretty 
really happy with it. And then I generated this. And cool. Yeah. So, <laughs> and that took, I don't know, uh, less than two hours. I probably should have kept track of the timing, the whole uh, experience. But I thought, you know, it was a very promising kind of experience in terms of how helpful it was, how much it was suggesting things, how, how good the suggestions were, how much it understood about things and how much it could explain things. So that's what I want to say about fireworks. Um, so what, one thing that everybody's been talking about with these chatbots is how important it is to do prompt engineering. And there are many contexts in which it really is important. But I've been surprised for almost all my experiments. I very, very rarely did any um, attempt to make good prompts. You know, I, I would copy and paste an error instead of saying, well, this is the error I found in the console. Or so, and, and this was the only one where I wanted it to be more of a tutor. So I had this, this, well, sorry, this prompt here, but that was, um, pretty much the only exception where I wasn't just having an ordinary conversation with it. And I haven't bothered to make it uh, use speech instead of typing these things, but that's straightforward to do, especially because, you know, browsers have uh, uh, speech uh, recognition APIs. Okay, so let me um, tell you a little bit about uh, these six other experiments I did. Okay, so, um, right. So here, <clears throat> I wasn't playing the, asking it to play the role of a tutor. I was treating it very much like pair programming. And um, I'm more the navigator suggesting things and chat GPT is the, the one actually generating the code or something. So I said, how can I create a web page with a button that when clicked speaks a random integer less than 1000 in a random language pitch rate and voice? So it um, you know, told me here's some HTML, here's the JavaScript. It had just three languages, but said you could add more. And um, it understood all about the, the speech synthesis um, API that the you know HTML5 all the browsers uh, have um, and it's picking a random pitch a random rate and a random language and uh, reporting errors and stuff so um, so just with what the first pass like this uh, when I clicked on the button, um, I saw that there was this error, no, no voices available. But then if I clicked again, everything worked fine from then on. And it understood exactly what was going wrong, which is that the get voices is asynchronous and they, they may not have been loaded when the first time you, you clicked on the button, but then the second time it's, it has is loaded. So you could um, program around this by um, uh, um, using a uh, on voices changed so that you you don't uh, try to say anything until you, this flag has been set that the voices have been loaded. Um, so that worked. And then I said, oh, well, it will be nice to display what the number is and the language. And, and I said, et cetera. And it understood perfectly well that meant the pitch and the rate and so on. And also, I didn't really like the idea of having to go to the console to see an error message. So could you report it some other way? And you know, it updated the HTML, updated the, the uh, JavaScript. And then uh, it was pretty ugly. So I just simply said, add CSS. I didn't you know, say more than that. And it generated uh, some reasonable CSS to make it all look nicer and explaining what it was and stuff. And then um, 
rather than have just those three uh, languages baked into it, I said, why don't you add all the languages that are available in Chrome? And I said in Chrome, but it actually comes up and it says Chrome here too, but it actually comes up with a solution that'll work for any uh, browser because it's just <clears throat> collecting all the languages that the browser has available and then pulling out the language code uh, from those languages, uh, the voices. So, um, so that worked and I, I, I had a working uh, version of this, but then I thought it'd be nice to have a, an additional um, capability in this app. So I said, add a cartoon image of a parrot that when you click on it, repeats what the user says with a random language pitch rate and voice. So it, um, you know, it has this uh, parrot that thing and it says, you know, I should put, replace that with my path to whatever I put the parrot image. And then it knew perfectly well how to use the speech recognition um, API to uh, pick up what somebody was saying. And uh, that worked. And then I said, well, give the user feedback as to what text it was it actually had heard along with the other things that were there. And um, and then I said, you know, we had a button for speak a random number, but I said, use this file again. And you can see this is basically, I went to Dolly and said, you know, a colorful collection of random integers. And it generated that image and I just asked it to incorporate it in the app. Um, and then it didn't look so nice. They were uh, vertical and they were kind of small. So I said, make them larger and lay them out horizontally. And it had no problems doing that. And then I, I just thought, you know, how would you explain what this app does to a young child? And it says the app had has two pictures, one of colorful numbers, another parrot. When you click on the picture of colorful numbers, the app will make your computer or phone say a random number. It's like picking a number out of a hat, but the computer does it for you. So it's really trying to, you know, explain this at a, to a young child pretty well, I think. And, the, you know, it's even more fun as the number will be spoken in a different language, voice, speed each time. And now when you click on the parrot picture, the app listens to what you say, just like a parrot listening to you talk. And then the parrot, actually the computer pretending to be the parrot, will repeat what you, really nice, I thought, explanation. Um, and then I said, well, can it translate what was heard? And it says, sure, you could use Google Translate and you need an API key. And here's the, the um, way to talk to that API. And now you should you know, put the API key here and it goes on and on. And I um, um, asked, you know, said the API key shouldn't be baked in, it should ask for it. And, uh, um, uh, and then I, um, I, I have a, I thought it might be better to use Hugging Face instead of Google Translate. So I said, how about using Hugging Face instead? And it was perfectly fine to use Hugging Face. Uh, but then when I tried it, I kept getting these error messages. And uh, what was really happening was that um, when you ask Hugging Face to use a, a, a particular model, it, if it wasn't already loaded, it'll load it and give you back a response saying it's loading, please wait an estimated you know, 10 seconds or something. But the code wasn't paying attention to that. And also I didn't really want it to wait so even though it, it explained what was going on and how to fix it, I just went and got a, a Google Translate um, key. And um, so let me show you the result. So I'm not gonna bother with the translate because I'd have to get my key and paste it and all that, but it works perfectly fine without it. So if I click here, <laughs> So it picked Italian at a very high pitch and a low rate. Or, 408. Well, that was a normal. And then if I do this, it should be uh, listening. It should be. Oh, yeah. It should be listening to me as I speak. 
It should be listening to my speak. Um, and again, if I if we had the API key, it would have translated that to French and said it. <laughs> and again, I have this uh, link to the the dialogue, so you could actually see how this was created. And I have to mention that this parrot, my two year old granddaughter, just giggled and giggled and giggled when we'd say things to it, and it would repeat it, and it would repeat it in a funny voice or something. And would repeat it in a funny voice or something. Anyway, she thought that was just so funny. Okay. Um, so let me uh, talk about the next one. So I said, how can I make a web page that detects which way I'm pointing my finger and uses it to draw on a canvas? So my original concept was that if I pointed this way, it would draw that way. If I pointed this way, it would draw that way and so on. But it misunderstood me, but actually came up with an equally good scheme that I wasn't didn't bother uh, pursuing. So. What's so interesting about this is just from this, it uh, you know does all, generates all this HTML and CSS, but the JavaScript actually I think it says it here too that it, it yeah it's actually going to use a machine learning model that's um, a hand pose that'll figure out you know uh, thirty three different uh, locations on your finger you know the each joint and so on. And um, it knows how to load it and use it and so on. Oh, and also, of course, how to get the video feed going into it. Uh, and then here, how to load the TensorFlow.js uh, library, and then how to load the hand pose model, and how to use it, and then how to use it to detect if I'm my fingers pointing upward. And um, and this is what, an interesting thing that it, sometimes it's generating code and just stops in the middle. Um, or the, in this case, the explanation, and that's because you know it uh, it, it only uh, does so much of a completion. It's limited to I don't know a thousand or two thousand tokens or something. But if you just say please continue, it just apologizes and just starts right where it, pretty much where it left off, and and you know continues generating code. And then I said, well, nothing's being drawn, and it says, oh, there's some issue about the position on the canvas. And it turns out it was a bit confused about the, two, the coordinate system of the um, hand pose and the coordinate system of the uh, canvas. But um, it, it tried to fix it. And then I said, well, now it's only drawing in a small area. And it finally you know, gets it right with uh, some changes. And then this is this problem where it, uh, it uses some variable called predictions. but um, but it was, oh, in this case, I think it was a scoping error, but sometimes it's because it had a different name in some other part of the code. So it su suggests how to pass the, uh, make it available here. Um, and then I said, well, how about if you say the, a color, it'll change to the color that the user spoke. And it, um, it once again, uses speech recognition and, uh, and, uh, only accepts you know these ten different colors, and if if you um, say any of those, if if what you said includes any of the these ten colors, then it'll switch to that color. And there's a default color of black, and so on. Uh, and then it turned out it, it, it worked the first time, but only the first time, and it said, "Whoops, sorry for the confusion. I should be using uh, the API build differently," and it regenerates the code. And everything's working. And I said, well, let's display what, what the last thing spoken in the current color so that people know that it's here hearing it. And then this was very nice. I just said, add instructions on how to use the app. And it generates, you know, the, the um, HTML to explain how to use it and to make some CSS to make that look nice. And then somehow the display didn't get right. Um, Again, because I think it was forgetting what it was calling things before, and it was using different, uh, similar but different names here. Uh, and again, the same problem that it couldn't it picked up the wrong variable name or something. Um, so we thought the problem might have been that uh, we were doing things before the page was loaded, but that wasn't really the problem. 
So I said that we, if that didn't fix it. And then I said, just, I didn't have to say much more, same problem. And it tries another way to fix it. And that didn't help. So I had an idea of what was wrong, but I wasn't right either. And it said, uh, it thought maybe that was the issue. Um, so, oh, and also notice this problem, like, you know, whether it was calling it video or webcam, it, you know, wasn't consistently naming things. So anyways, finally got it all uh, working and, and I didn't understand what happened. So somehow it started to work, even though these changes didn't seem, I don't know. Uh, oh, and then there was a really minor problem that took forever to fix, which was it was showing uh, the last thing that it heard and then the color all in the same line and it would look nicer if they were on separate lines and it, it just keeps not getting it right. And finally, uh, you know, I said, maybe it's this something to do with the overlay. And, and then it comes up with this um, solution that I didn't even know about. There was some fancy um, CSS to deal with the problem. Uh, so everything's working fine. And then I said, you know, could you explain to a 10 year old how it would work? And once again, it, it does a really nice job of explaining how this thing works. And let me show you how it, what it's like. Oh, but uh, I have to turn off the uh, um, video. Turn off the video, right? Now let me try loading it again. Um, so notice that it generated these uh, instructions all by itself. And uh, see, I turned off. Video. Oh, here it comes. Good. So now if I move my finger like this and I say red, red, blue, 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 it's kind of, you know, it's working. Not very nice, <laughs> but I'm able to, to draw all over it with my finger. A five-year-old or a 10-year-old will really like that. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah, no, actually, my granddaughter, that's just funny too, that I can draw on it. So. Okay. So uh, but that was what I thought was interesting was, you know, it did, had, had no troubles loading a machine learning model, using it appropriately to get the hand poses. It just knew how to do all those sort of things. So the next example I wanted to talk about is um, if some, some uh, person wanted to actually do a little bit of machine learning on some of their own data. So I had this. A spreadsheet which was had just 60 examples, 20 examples of some text that shows a lot of confidence, 20 examples that shows a real lack of confidence, and 20 that were kind of neutral. And I said, how can I make a web page that would predict the level of confidence of some new text? And it gives, you know, an ex gives some suggestions and and, but oh, but but I didn't say anything about JavaScript, so it thought, oh, I should just do this all in Python. And then I said, no, no, I don't want to do it in Python. How could I do it in JavaScript? And then it says, well, here's how you could do it using Node. And I, I just wanted a web page, so I say, no, I don't want to use Node. I only want the browser. And it says, oh, well, here's how we could do it. So, um, you know, it's loading TensorFlow.js. It creates the model, a very small model, and uh, compiles it and does the training and um, and then does a prediction and shows the shows what's going on. And again, it stopped right in the middle of the generating. I just said continue and it continued generating. And then it said, you know, I should have um, these two files. Uh, um, and then I have to put the, the CSV file somewhere in that same folder. So, so it actually, uh, worked, but yeah, there was no feedback that it, while it was training. So I said, can you make a graph of the training loss? And um, so it, it loads some library and it knows perfectly well how to integrate this library uh, with the uh, callback of the training. And um, it worked, but the plot was much bigger than the page and it 
looked pretty ugly. So I said it was too big and had CSS, so I made it nice, makes it look nicer. And then I said, you know, why don't you, for, why don't you get, show the likelihood scores for the predictions? And he said, does it could do that? And it does. And then I asked, how can I make this more accurate? Because it wasn't very accurate. And it says, well, you could have more data. You could do some pre-processing or mutation. You could change the model architecture. You could, um, you know, all these things. And I said, well, how about you improve the model architecture? And it says, sure. And it makes a, a, a bigger model with more layers. And, um, and then I said, well, maybe the user wants to explore how many epochs that give a interface so the user can enter how many epochs they want. And um, the graph came up after it was finished training. So I said, could you make the graph be updated while it's doing the training? And it said, sure, and I had to do that. And then, you know, can you, can you finish? And then I said, could you, the, the training function was pretty complicated. So I said, could you add comments to it? And notice, you know, for each section, it, it says, okay, you know, getting the inputs, preparing the data, creating the model, setting up the graph, you know, setting up the callback. And it just goes on and on, explaining it nicely. And then, um, I happened to notice that um, it was it gave very different answers depending on whether it had uppercase or not. And it understood exactly what was going on, that it was using the universal sentence encoder and it's case sensitive and it can um, um, uh, it could easily fix this by, of course, just taking whatever the user input and sending it to lowercase so there wasn't that difference. And there it was. So let's see it in action. So I'm going to say, I don't know, 80 steps just because it, so it says training, but it's actually um, uh, coming up with the embeddings for the 60 sentences. And there it's the, now we get the training and the, see the uh, validation loss is going up and a, so it's overfitting or something. But I could type something here like, I'm sure what I say predict. And it says 99.7% sure that it's confident. And, and I say, uh, I don't know. Uh, and there we go. And then uh, well, didn't do so good. Should have been neutral, but thought that was well. Maybe it's showing some confidence. Let me give you a talk on it. Anyway, so that I thought was pretty impressive that it could do something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so. Um, Let's see. So uh, in terms of timing, I, uh, I don't want to show all of these because they'll take too long, but I wanted to, uh, I'll sh I think I'll show two more, but I'll try to go quickly. Is that That's good fine. Okay, so this one is using, asking chat GPT to use GPT to make a, uh, uh, a conversation between uh, personas. And um, it, you know, it knows how to. Uh, well, actually, it didn't know how to call the uh, uh, the API. Um, oh, but well, so, so at various points, I had to copy and paste the documentation from their website, and it then was able to to do it fine. Um, and um, Again, it was trying to use Node. I said, no, no, I don't want to. And, and this is interesting that it says, well, if you're using the API key in the front end, that's a little bit not recommended because the, the key could get, well, um, somebody might be able to get your key or whatever. Um, let me, maybe this one, uh, I could just, oh, I, I do want to um, show you one bug that was so funny. Yeah, here it is. I, <laughs> So there's trying to be a conversation between Aristotle and Galileo, but what, but it, at this point in, in the 
progress. It, Aristotle says, I am Galileo, and Galileo says, I am Aristotle, I am not Galileo, and then Aristotle says, I am Galileo, I am Galileo, I am both Aristotle. It just was totally crazy, but <laughs> it understood what was wrong here and how to, you know, um, change the roles and, and uh, the, the right uh, messages to the chat system such that, um, uh, let me show you, uh, well, actually, just in the interest of time, I'll just show you a screenshot. Um, so, uh, so you could enter any two people here, and then you could join in by just typing a message here and saying send. So Galileo greets Aristotle, and they're both really polite to each other, and they appreciate each kind words, and then blah, blah. blah. And then I jump in and say, well, how fast do objects fall? And Aristotle says to Galileo, you know, some people have challenged, it seems to know things that happened after he died, but, you know, that his motion, ideas of motion of a challenge, but he still maintains the speeds proportional to the weight. And Galileo says, you know, uh, uh, oh, and then there's some weird bug where it's, it actually repeats this twice. And I, I mentioned it to ChatGPT, but I, made the mistake of mentioning that and another problem and it dealt with the other problem and I never came back to figuring out why sometimes it repeats. But anyways, um, Aristotle's respectfully disagreeing and explaining this and go, so it was a nice little, you know, uh, little app where you can yeah. create these sorts of things. Um, and so let me show you the the, the most complicated one. I'll tell you real quick what, well, I'll just show you this one right readily. Um, this one, um, the flowers are all fading away and shrinking, but I could drop water balloons on them and they get bigger or something. So that's yeah. the little game. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know. So you know, it's hard to keep watering all these flowers, you know, anyway. so that's, that, that was what it, uh, you know, we did with a little conversation, but this was a, a funny one because it actually was partially working and then it, in trying to add another feature, it broke some of the earlier stuff and then it just wasn't, it, it, it this was about the only time when I really had some um, not very good results, but then when I started over again, it actually did well and also i have links here for how you know bard did trying this or something okay so this is the um the really big ambitious one that i did <clears throat> it's um i counted it i think 111 uh, exchanges back and forth and in the beginning what i asking it to do is to um create uh generate a story and i picked this um because um uh, neil gaiman uh, in sandman there's this story where this character has kidnapped a muse and for punishment he's um getting so many ideas for stories that it's that he's going crazy he can't think of anything other than stories and there's like a lot of crazy stories, including a man who falls in love with a paper doll. So I actually did all 15 that came from that uh, story, plus of some other ones that I invented. Anyways, so it generates, you know, three paragraphs like, like I asked. And then I said, can you criticize them? And it says, oh, well, we could do this character development or better setting. And it's not generic ones. It's saying the town, the theater was only briefly mentioned. Maybe you could improve that or something. And I say, oh, well, apply suggestions one and four, and it does that. And then I say, well, you know, come up with criticism for the second paragraph. So it's able to criticize its own generation, its own creations, and, and then apply changes. So then I said, so put it all together into a single story. And then I said, uh, generate a description of an illustration for each paragraph, include the medium, the artistic style, mood, point of view, lighting, and the like. And it comes up with these kinds of uh, things. So then at that point I said, well, I'd like to make a web page in which you could do this interactively. And then 
um, we, we get we, it works, but then um, eventually works, I should say. And this is a place where it didn't know how to use the um, Dolly um, uh, API, but I just uh, pasted the documentation and then, you know, it's really just copy and paste it with all the, you know, crazy stuff that happens when you just copy and paste, but it still understood it well enough to generate the, the right code. And um, so then I, uh, it goes on and on very long, this one. I, I, once I got it working for that, I said, well, let's make it work for any story and let's make it so that you could criticize the uh, illustrations and generate new ones and so on. And maybe I'll show you the final result here. Uh, here it is. Oh, by the way, I even, if you, if you want to get a, an, an idea of how I did this without going through the entire 111 things, I, I kind of highlighted the main things of what I did and what happened and what was going on here. Um, and, uh, oh yeah, and then the, uh, here it is. So we, by the way, it generated all of the, the, the instructions here. So it, it tells you, again, this is, I just said add, in, add instructions in the beginning with a button to close them. And it explains how this whole thing works. So then, um, uh, you know, it needs my uh, key there. And then I say, um, I don't know, can give me, I didn't try this before. Three, three is probably good. So one thing you could do here was I added this button that could actually show you the communications with GPT-4 and with Dolly so you could see what actually is, you know, it, it, it does. Um, so this shouldn't take more than another, less than a minute, I think. So this is going to have all of those features that I kind of experimented with in the dialogue. So you could ask for ask it to generate criticism. You could decide to apply the criticism, to rewrite a paragraph, and you could also get criticism about the illustrations. And you could even enter your own criticism of an illustration, and it'll regenerate. I mean, it'll um, update the illustration prompt and then generate a new uh, story and it should uh, interleave the text and the um, uh, images. So um, one of the problems with using GPT-4 is that it's so much slower than 3.5. 3.5 would have, you know, done this in, uh, long ago, but uh, four does just as such a nicer job that I tend not to use it. Obviously I could have asked GPT-4 to make a, an interface where you could decide which, um, which model you want to use for doing this. Um, maybe what I should do, oh, here it comes finally. So I stood nervously at the podium of the prestigious Stanford University preparing <laughs> An elite seminar series in electrical engineering. He had spent countless hours perfecting his presentation on sustainable energy systems and was the culmination of his hard work. As he looked out at the gathering of intelligent faces, eager to hear what he had to say, he felt a sense of pride, but also mounting pressure to deliver announcing the speech. And here I am giving this speech. And if I um, if I hover over it, we could see that it says the illustrations of watercolor painting with realistic and softly blended colors depicting the anxious Ken standing at the podium, the setting is well lit hall with the, the iconic Stanford University seal in the background. I don't know if that's true. Um, gentle lighting, enhancing it, and intensity. The point of view is from the audience looking up. So it's a bit confused because the audience is there and it's looking at the audience, but this is a Dolly problem. It's, it's actually generated. So if I click on this, Here's the, the description, and um, uh, well, 
that's interesting. Well, for some, oh, maybe it's still thinking because I think it's going to it's going to show some suggested changes to the uh, uh, to the um, thing. I don't know. So maybe I'll just say. I don't know. I say apply changes. So it'll rewrite the description. Um, and then once it's the description's rewritten, I could hit. So now it should say, yeah, an oil painting with realistic blend card. And then I say replace the image and it'll generate a new one or something. And even while this is happening, I could, I think I could click, oh, here it comes anyway. So I'll close this. And there I am giving a, a lecture. It, it looks um, just like you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then if I click here, uh, I'll get some criticism that it'll generate for the uh, first paragraph here. By the way, we could see what the other paragraphs look like. Whoa, the audience got excited here. <laughs> um, uh, this is the pro AI group. Yeah. And then, uh, wow, it looks like everybody wanted my autograph at the end. Uh, satisfied smile interacts with the congratulatory crowd, a warm lady, creates a mood of accomplishment and pride. And it's pretty good. As he concluded the talk and entertained questions, it was clear that he had made an impact. Professors and students alike approached him praising. This is pretty good. <laughs> Anyways, uh, if, if we go here, so it generated seven suggestions for how to change this paragraph. A better opening sentence, uh, introduce more background on Ken so that the readers understand my qualifications or reasons for giving the talk, whatever. And I could even say here, you know, change it from energy systems to chat or whatever. So that's the um, the, the, the most ambitious uh, app that I created with uh, ChatGPT. So I'm practically finished here. Um, so one question in my mind is, doing this, does it automate away the fun of programming? Or is it better to think of this as empowering people with very little programming skills to create all sorts of, uh, be very creative in creating apps. And um, Seymour Papert often wrote about hard fun because uh, one of the children talked about how programming in Logo was, was hard fun, that it was, or he probably said it was fun, but hard at the same time. So um, that's still the case, but it's also for a lot of, children, they find it frustrating or too difficult and, you know, it just doesn't always work to introduce programming to, to children. And, um, and also there's sometimes the teachers don't, aren't much support because they don't understand very well how to program either. So the, the plus side is that by having a collaboration like this, anybody with just an idea for an app that's reasonable, obviously, if you wanted to make you know, a, a triple A rated game or something, you're not likely to succeed. Uh, but it could come to life through this kind of process. Well, of course, GPT-4 is GPT-4. There will be a five and a six and a seven and an eight. Yeah, exactly. That, that's exactly what I'm talking about the future here. So um, in the short term, we could expect it just to get, you know, more competent and the GPT-4 can, uh, res, uh, look at images and understand them, but that's only been released to a, to a very small number of, of uh, testers um, and, and some company that's producing uh, software for blind people. Um, but, but that's coming. So you could, you should be able to just like take a screenshot of, of a problem with your app and then say, well, here's, here's what it, what's going on and it'll, interpret the image and maybe figure out how to fix things. And this copy and paste thing is, you know, obviously can be automated. Uh, and, um, you know, the, probably as many of you know about the 
the leaked Google Doc that claims that uh, the open source alternatives to uh, BARD and uh, GPT-4 are getting so good that uh, maybe the big players don't really have any particular edge over what's going on in the open source world. Um, so maybe that'll be uh, something that near term could be done. But the long term, who knows, it's clearly going to keep getting better and, uh, and more capable and so on. So I, I asked uh, Dolly to create a watercolor painting for the question and answer portion of the talk. Uh, and I said, no text should be included. And it, it you know, <laughs> well, it didn't pay attention. So uh, hopefully there are some questions. So. How do you so, like working with an AI as a, as a uh... Uh, colleague yeah um the the first thing the, the fireworks thing was the most pleasant one because it was it was trying to be you know had this role more of a of a of a tutor the um the other ones it was still you know uh, really interesting but i felt like it was kind of writing this program and asking me to do a lot of copy and pasting, you know, <laughs> and to report about errors, you know, that I, that was sort of my role. That I, was, I mean, I, of course, the, that's not quite fair because what I also did was, and this is maybe an important aspect of this, is that I always started with the simplest version of the app that I had in mind. And once I got that, I would ask for a single enhancement. And once that works, another one. So I was, I was, I did have a, a an incremental plan for how the app should get built that was purely mine and and it was um, you know my assistant in that role but but often it was more like you know um, just telling me okay here's some code replace this here's some code you know copy and paste this and um, but it was still something exciting about the fact that you know it, it understood me so well and I was um, and it was able to do so many things. It knew all these different APIs and uh, was better at CSS than I am for sure. Yeah. Not hard, at least in my experience, CSS is not transparent. <laughs> right. So um, I attended a uh, talk at Stanford uh, a couple of weeks ago and they did a study of the security of the code generated, I think it was by Copilot, code generator, mm -hmm. and they found that it was dismal. In fact, programmers who used Copilot produced less secure code than those who did not, but the ones who did thought their code was more secure. And the conclusion of that study was that the assistant lacks context. Um, while you were showing some of the examples, I was just scrolling through um, the text and it, and it looks like it's the same problem there that the assistant is losing context. Um, any comments on that? Yeah, no, that, that was the other annoying thing was that it was losing context. And there were a few times when I realized that it, it just uh, had completely forgotten what the, the source code for, for a part of it or so I would copy and paste something from much earlier and said, you know, and here's the this function, or here's this uh, uh, HTML that we're we're using, and that often would would help because now it was in the more. Uh, I wasn't way. thinking so much of forgetting, as uh, it seemed that in some cases it uh, it misinterpreted the context of what you were asking uh, because it, uh, it didn't know the environment in which you were working. Yeah. Um, well, generally, um, I mean, like that example where with the video one, where I had originally intended, oh, I should put my video back on. Um, um, I originally intended, you know, that, that I could point with my finger in different directions and that would indicate which way the, the pen would move or something, as opposed to the, way it came up with. But I was just as happy with that rather than trying to get it to uh, in, uh, interpret it the way I intended. But 
in terms of security, I thought it was pretty impressive that it, it really tried hard to talk me out of uh, using the API key in a static web page like this. Uh, on the other hand, I you know I said you know make it a password field and <clears throat> you know it's uh, it's not a, really a problem that um, that a user is putting the the key into a, a, a web page like this. But of course. It, it, once it's hosted somewhere, you, somebody has to trust that you're not stealing their key. But of course, the, the in every one of these cases, you could look at view source and the code is actually quite clear and nice. So somebody could see that the API key isn't uh, sent off to somebody or something. Uh, so in, in, in this kind of context, I don't think the security is such an issue, but Obviously, uh, if you're if you're making a, a some kind of web service, and you know, there's a lot more things to think about in terms of security. Yeah, I was I wasn't so worried about security for these apps as much as uh, the context issue. Um, there's so, so much implicit context that the programmer has that the the, the assistant does not. Right. Yeah, I, I imagine it'd be quite different if I was doing some really large project uh, because, you know, um, so the, the, this last one, the, the illustrated story generator, it did, it was a little more than 500 lines of JavaScript. So, and, um, and that's actually too large for the, at least the default version of chat GPT. I can't say, you know, paste in this entire 500 lines and say, okay, now let's, uh, modify it in some way. It's just too much context. I mean, it, too many tokens for it to be fit its context window. So there, there are these limitations. Of course, the, like I just saw today some startup saying they, they've got a context window of 50,000 tokens while I've been you know, using, I think, 8,000 or something. So the, and there's even some research paper that claimed that they had a uh, a million uh, token context that was using some clever algorithms because you know the the context normally is a quadratic uh, complexity, but if if you're clever, you can make it n log n or something. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I I, I I am really blown away, Ken. This is uh, this is uh, uh, a very nice expression to how people seem to be using the uh, the uh, uh, artificial intelligence devices or personal persona uh, as as a, as a component in a larger system, and mm -hmm. I guess now the ads we see for um, you know doctors who use AI and. Uh, dentists who use AI and uh, people who play with AI driven games and so forth uh, has has more context in terms of the uh, current uh, AI systems. I think that's a very useful thing. Yeah, you're back. Yeah. I think I, I, I really appreciate uh, the introduction because I I had uh, not thought about this part of it. I always thought the hard part was twiddling the knobs on the uh, uh, the uh, the data used to do run the AI. But just talking to the AI turns out to be complex enough. Yeah, um, you know, if you, if you go back a year, you had to give it you know, several examples of what you were intending and had to engineer your prompt kind of carefully to get it to be pretty competent. But GPT-4, as I, as I mentioned, I really just seemed much more of a natural conversation. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I'm really, I'm curious to see how, you know, a 12 year old deals with such things, you know, that are probably better than you and I do. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Uh, yeah, my 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 favorite story is watching a uh, uh, a non-speaking child, 
sort of order six months old, stealing his mother's phone and the, her password and then using it to play his video. <laughs> wow. I mean, this is this is adaptation at a very low rate or a very high rate. Mm. Uh, somebody's got a somebody's got a question. Are you watching the hands up, Dennis? I'm not watching it at all. Um, what do you want to you want to uh, call people and put them up? Yeah, go ahead. You got your hand up. Yeah, uh, I was just I, I had a question about um, the edges of the models uh, understanding of programming. Uh, is there any indication or what, what was your experience in uh, finding the edges of uh, the what the model knew about a particular API or uh, or programming in general? I mean, it's, I was specifically thinking I use a, a prototypal inheritance over the newer class inheritance. And I was just kind of curious. There's probably a lot less, a lot fewer code examples of that on the on the internet, uh, so probably less training data for that. And I was just curious if you encountered, if you looked at how the model degrades. Yeah, um, well, I, I, I didn't really, but I did notice something about the, its coding styles, um, and it wasn't always consistent, like a, a, a tiny example, but maybe illustrative one is that this problem about you know, where the JavaScript's trying to uh, get an element from the DOM, but the page hasn't loaded uh, yet. It, it was using sometimes this on load as a, you know, um, and sometimes it was using a, a listener to on DOM content loaded, which is what I've read is the proper, better way of doing it. That on load is an older way that isn't as good, but it still kind of works. So, so there is this kind of, uh, um, in that case, there's two different issues. One is whether it's on load or on DOM, DOM content load, but also as to whether it's using, it's actually using at event listener or whether it's just setting the listener directly. And it kind of wasn't consistent. Sometimes it would do one, sometimes the other. And, it, you know, again, because I guess most of the programs that it looked at were consistent about which way they would deal with that. Just like a real program. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, no, but, it, but it, um, it, it's just, but a, a real programmer tends to have a, one style in which they stick to for those kinds of tasks. But it was, I thought it was a bit odd that it was kind of flip-flopping about whether it was, you know, which way would deal with that problem. Real programmers um, coming back six months later will not be consistent with what well, they that's true, yeah. <laughs> it was a very nice presentation. Thank you. Uh, very cool things it can do in terms of programming. And uh, you mentioned the prompt engineering um, before, so that it may not require any more prompt engineering uh, almost at all. So that it recognized you so well. And you also mentioned role playing as uh, one of the mm -hmm. techniques. So mm -hmm. now they are more developing stress and techniques rather than engineering of prompt itself. Uh, but maybe from your experience of these projects, uh, what these techniques would you found helpful? Uh, maybe you found something of your own that helped you to navigate the chat GPT-4? Um, well, the, the, the problem a little bit was that um, I, I, I was always, really the, the underlying motivation for a lot of this was thinking about, you know, what kind of uh, learning materials or experience would I imagine like a high school student having. So I was rarely kind of role playing myself. I was often, you know, pretending in my head, to, you know, to be maybe a high school student that knew a little bit about this and not much about that or something. So, uh, but what I, uh, maybe I'll try this soon, which is if, especially if it's a younger child, I think if you set up the, the context better and I say, you know, um, you know, you're going to be helping a, a nine year old who doesn't know much about programming to build an, the app that they want, you know, be sure to explain things 
carefully and not use too much technical jargon. You set up set up a, a context like that, that it would tend to, I, I believe it, but I haven't tried this, that it would tend to uh, use language much more appropriate to uh, communicate with a nine-year-old. Because it does, there's two examples of where I said, after it built an app, I said, well, could you explain to a nine-year-old or a young child how this app would work? It, I thought it did a great job of explaining it in, in uh, you know, the right kind of vocabulary and the right kind of analogies. Um, but I, I, I should really um, come up with a, a task that actually I want to do and just stop pretending to be a student and just see, you know, what I could accomplish as well. Um, I mean, one reason I'm doing it this way is I mean, I've always been interested in kids and programming, but also there's, there's an awful lot of real programmers that are using uh, ChatGPT to get uh, accomplish their day-to-day -day tasks. So I thought this would be a more of a unique experience to think in terms of, of how children might deal with this. And when I say children, of course, it could be uh, an adult that knows no programming, a hobbyist or something, but I mean, a non-expert programmer. Okay, that's very interesting. Thank you. It's uh, also, Recently, I listened to a podcast with Lee Chazen, uh, which was an educator who also worked now on the content strategies. And he used role playing uh, in the beginning, like you did with a child, to actually create a content uh, for the children. So, in terms of uh, how they can study the material, because he was a teacher before, uh, I think, teaching history, and uses these uh, prompts like of role playing to actually create the tasks that the children would understand or certain uh, output that would be um, better suited for the audience, so levels of understanding. So I think what you also showed here is how well it works uh, in terms of this first uh, e example that you showed, so that mm -hmm. it really stands you nicely as if you were indeed uh, a younger adult or mm -hmm. uh, child. So uh, yes. and. My question may be also additionally uh, meant to ask what other techniques you found helpful, like maybe it's not only role playing, but something else, maybe some structuring or giving examples. Uh, did it also help you in the process? Yeah, well, so part of the problem is that at the same time I was doing this, I was also curious about, could it really understand me if I just say, you know, uh, a, B, et cetera, and I don't really list everything out. Or if I say, you know, that was, it didn't go high enough without giving much detail. So I was kind of really wanting to explore how, how, uh, how well I could do it if I was um, not being very careful to give it detailed instructions or, or, or a large amount of context just to see, you know, could it still respond appropriately? Um, one thing I should say too is that uh, you know the Khan Academy um, has uh, been working with ChatGPT to, to make a um, a tutor that they gave a demo of, of teaching algebra, and it was really very very good at giving hints and giving feedback when the student did things wrong. But if the student said, "Well, what's the answer? What's how do I solve this?" it'll it'll keep saying, "No, I'm." I'm not going to give you the answer, but here's a hint or something. So it, it, it was, they had set up the context appropriately. So it, it, it would not, um, you know, it would be a good pedagogic tutor and not be just uh, a chatbot that would just give you answers when asked, when asked for it. But in my, in my case, I thought, I thought that it was, I could have maybe tried to, uh, early on say something like, well, you're giving me too much code, you know, I want to be able to do more of it myself or something. I, I could have done that and it would have taken me longer, but it would have given me more hints and more little pieces to put together. But um, but I think it's it was the way I did it, I think was plausible for some student that, you know, would be happy with these pretty high level things and some copying and pasting, but also some creating things on their own. Um, Thank you. Sure. 
Any more questions? Well, Ken, thank you very, very much. Yeah, I, I, I love being educated uh, in this uh, in this area, and uh, uh, yeah, I, I qualify as a barely marginal student, I mm -hmm. guess. Um, and what happens is, I think that we see examples of reverse aging, that the young kids are much more successful than the older people. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'd like to claim that I know how to do things, but oftentimes don't. Um, anyhow, thank you very much. Yes, um, thank you. It was fun.